We can then move on to item number six, the public hearing on an EU long-term strategy towards Russia. As we all know, unfortunately, the status of EU-Russia relations is not good at all. In the last few weeks, we have witnessed numerous expulsions of diplomats triggered by malign activities of the Russian security services in EU member states such as Bulgaria, Romania, Italy and the Czech Republic, just to name a few. Furthermore, the Kremlin blacklisted without a justification prominent EU officials, including the President of our Parliament, Mr. Sassoli, and also the Vice President of the European Commission, Ms. Jourova. The Presidents of the Parliament, the Council and the Commission have firmly condemned these arbitrary measures, which are indeed targeting the European Union directly and not only the individuals concerned. In parallel, we are witnessing that Russia is continuing its violent crackdown on the opposition and is exerting increased pressure on its neighbours, such as Belarus and Ukraine, including by way of hybrid warfare and fully-fledged military build-ups. It is sure that, as our Vice President and High Representative Josep Borrell recently said, quote, Europe and Russia are unfortunately drifting apart. Russia is progressively disconnecting itself from Europe and looks at democratic values as an existential threat, unquote. Against this background, the EU is working on an updated strategy towards Russia and a reflection of what is ongoing within the EU institutions. Just recently, the Vice President High Representative told us that this updated policy will develop along three main lines. The first one, to push back when Russia infringes international law and human rights. The second line, to contain Russia when it seeks to increase its pressure on us. And the third line, to engage with Russia on issues on which we have an interest to do so. The European Parliament, and in particular our committee, is going to contribute to the reflection process through a recommendation that will be steered by our standing rapporteur and Russia expert, Andreas Kabilius, who I welcome in today's meeting. In order to gather proposals and useful ideas for this exercise, I have invited three distinguished experts to provide us with their views on what should be the main futures of our EU strategy towards Russia. With all that in mind, I think it is important that we start with the Russian perspective. Therefore, I will give the floor to Mr. Vladimir Milov, who is a Russian politician, publicist, economist, and former Deputy Minister of Energy of the Russian Federation. Mr. Milov had to flee Russia a few weeks ago in order to escape the repression carried out by the Russian government against the opposition. Therefore, dear Mr. Milov, let me convey you the sympathy of our committee. Mr. Milov will give us a presentation on the EU policy towards Russia from a Russian perspective. In particular, he will probably make suggestions on how to enhance its effectiveness and improve its perception by the Russian people. Mr. Milov, the floor is now yours for exactly 15 minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. It's an honor to speak here again. It's been a while since Alexei Navalny and myself had spoken at these committee hearings in November. Uh, you see that a lot has changed, and unfortunately it did change in line with what we had predicted. Uh, we have been issuing a warning signs about uh, Putin's escalating uh, crackdown on opposition at home and aggressive policies abroad. So the events of the past weeks uh, can hardly come as a surprise if you just rewind and rewatch those hearings in November. Uh, we saw that coming and uh, fortunately we're lucky to have a lot of people in the European Parliament, members of the European Parliament, who also understand what's going on, and basically uh, members of different uh, party groups and factions in the European Parliament have been exactly warning about the same thing, that uh, the situation will become more severe, there will be more aggressive behavior, more crackdown on uh, domestic opposition in Russia, so we see that happening. 
uh, Navalny is in jail and there is a grave danger to his health because of lack of, uh, lack of proper access to him and uh, uh, lack of uh, normal medical treatment, uh, we see uh, major figures from the Russian opposition being either detained or put under house arrest or forced to flee the country for safety. We see uh, police and security services visiting literally tens of thousands uh, of Russians who participated in uh, recent street rallies, threatening them with more repression. Uh, and uh, according to human rights groups, uh, at this moment, the number of political prisoners in Russia is about 400 people, which is roughly two times larger than it was in Brezhnev's era in the late Soviet Union. And it's not just domestic policy. We always try to warn you for the past couple of decades that Putin will not just stop at home with a crackdown on uh, his uh, domestic rivals. Uh, he will export this aggressive behavior abroad. So uh, we have been seeing a lot of this happening recently, amassing the troops at the Ukraine border. So far, nothing happened, but we have to be watchful and uh, uh, as we know from past examples, you never know what's uh, on Putin's mind next. And this recent diplomatic row uh, with European countries because of the malign actions of security services, Russian security services on uh, European soil. So there is clear an escalation, uh, which was very visible. It was coming in plain sight. A, a lot of Russian watchers including ourselves, have actually warned uh, uh, Europeans that uh, this is coming. And uh, I also want to thank European Parliament for not only for your firm and unwavering support of the forces who still continue to struggle in Russia for not only a better future for our country, but for normal relations and civilized relations with our neighbors, uh, for withdrawal from Putin's aggressive uh, foreign policy course, reversing it. Uh, we very much welcomed the resolutions that have been adopted in September and January uh, on uh, the Russian strategy by the European Parliament. Uh, and actually, this is one of the reasons why Putin goes as far as to take such outrageous action as uh, uh, blacklisting the president uh, of the European Parliament, David Sassoli, which we strongly condemn. But it's also a very telling action uh, because uh, Putin... My European colleagues have been, some of them, been surprised by my previous statements that Putin considers United Democratic Europe as probably a bigger threat, an existential threat, than even the United States. Because the United States is a geopolitical foe of the old, somewhere across the ocean, has always been there. Plus, they can always sit together, discuss some sort of uh, new arms control treaty, uh, have a dialogue on security issues and human rights agenda is sort of being pulled back a bit. Europe is different. It's a great, successful, democratic space right next door with much greater extent of trade and everyday interaction with Russian people. Russian people see and acknowledge how successful Europe is and its transformation in the past 30, 40 years, particularly for countries who have been part of the communist empire ever since. We can see that an example like, you know, citizens of Kaliningrad region in Russia traveling to Poland or Lithuania to grocery stores to buy food and basic goods because it's cheaper and of better quality. I don't see a reverse flow. I'm not aware of Poles and Lithuanians traveling to Russia for uh, to buy anything. So uh, there's clearly a much uh, brighter example of uh, civilization success, if you will. United, strong, open, competitive, democratic Europe, which is next door, which is more visible to Russians, which is more vocal in defending uh, values of freedom and democracy as it came also in the recent uh, European Parliament resolutions. This is why uh, blacklists and sanctions against major European officials, which we strongly condemn. This is why I reiterate Putin sees Europe as a bigger existential threat even than uh, the United States. But however, and I'm sure you know that, and it's definitely not your fault, that the calls by European Parliament for a stronger action uh, on, uh, regarding Putin's malign behavior on the part of European Commission 
on uh, European governments have actually not been uh, answered so far. And uh, uh, there's been some action taken, which is still welcome because uh, uh, obviously it means a lot uh, that European uh, Union supports Russians' fight for freedom. However, it's clear that uh, Putin escalated his actions at home and abroad without any major obstacles. So simply what was done was not enough. And uh, it's important because it brings us to the issue of uh, cost of inaction, if you will. Because there are a lot of people who, who say that maybe, you know, if we don't do much, we don't irritate Putin, things will like sort of calm down by themselves and remain strategic dialogue on uh, important issues like uh, security or climate, uh, and then somehow we'll find a way out of the current mess. However, if you look at what's happening in reality, you see that Putin's aggressive standing at home and abroad is self-reproductory. Uh, he will not stop. His uh, idea of fighting for zones of influence maintaining his exclusive zone of influence at home, not allowing anybody to discuss human rights in Russia, zone of influence in the post-Soviet space, trying to restore control uh, over the nations that broke out of Russia's dominance and have chosen freedom and European integration, like Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, and others. You think he will stop doing that? Look carefully. He's, uh, he's already operating on the soil of uh, the Western European countries. Uh, the other European member countries well beyond the post-Soviet space, which uh, Putin have long declared at his desired zone of influence. Czech Republic, Bulgaria, Romania, other countries, I think we can find traces of his interference everywhere. This will not stop. So I think it is important still, even with dictators like that, I understand as a former government official that it's still important to maintain dialogue on strategic security issues. But point number one, a cost of inaction shall be understood because dictators like Putin take inaction as a sign of weakness. If you don't do anything reacting to his malicious behavior, well, it means that he can afford some more. He reads it exactly like this. So resolutions, great resolutions, very much welcomed resolutions, which were adopted on Russia by the European Parliament in September and January, not really followed by a serious comprehensive action on containing Putin by the European Council, the European Commission, that is a sign that all this will remain just words, just another expression of concern by Europe. So he can proceed. So we saw that happening in the past few months. So I think uh, it's important, like, you know, I would quote Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Uh, uh, I know some people want to, you know, pass a softer passage, uh, not really encouraging Putin for more aggressive action. But the quote is, open war is upon you, whether you would risk it or not. So uh, essentially, half a year which passed since our last discussion at this committee in November, I think uh, is really very telling. We predicted the escalation, escalation happened, and inaction on part of the democratic world, insufficient, uh, insufficient containment measures have played a great part. So I think this point should be specifically analyzed. And I wanted to ask Ed also a couple of words about dialogue. Dialogue is still important. We live in one world. We perfectly understand that. Uh, and the Russian opposition also, we're not only busy with our issues at home, we also want, together with you, to build a better, prosperous, democratic world. So we understand that global issues with Putin's participation need to be addressed. Arms control, security, non-proliferation, climate, whatever. But I think also from a reasonable point of view, it shall be understood that there should be limits for dialogue if your counterpart behaves like that. So there should be certain red lines. There should be certain rules in the room. Because, uh, I don't know, what, what else, what other threshold Putin should cross? He's already running around not only Russia, but Europe, killing people at will. Uh, he's amassing troops at the borders of our neighbors, uh, risking another aggression and open war. He's blowing up uh, 
uh, arms depots in, on the territory of European Union, killing people. I don't know. What, what, what else should he do uh, so that calls for dialogue shall be like put into a conditionality format? Yes, we want to have a dialogue with Putin, but we also uh, should not let ourselves be fooled uh, by his uh, tricky behavior. Just an example, climate. Putin is now to restore his international image, have switched to a, a very sweet rhetoric on climate. But take a look at what Russia is really doing. It is adopting government documents and plans to actually increase, significantly increase CO2 emissions. Just take a look at the plans that they have recently adopted. That means he is cheating. That means that those who call for dialogue should, I think, uh, uh, take a couple of more pills of realism and really understand what's going on uh, on the ground. I will not take uh, any, any more of your time, but I'll finish with this uh, several points. First, you need to understand how important it is uh, for us and also for Putin that Europe, uh, United Europe, is a very successful democratic project. You uh, have a lot of strength. You are a very important, bright, positive example for people in Russia who fight for our freedom. Do not underestimate yourselves. Act as a real standard bearer of democratic values in the world. And uh, second, there is a cost of inaction. You can't behave like, you know, we don't do any. We put this, uh, we delay this into, you know, some uh, faraway corner and the problem will go away by itself. No. There is a price for inaction. More inaction means Putin will do more escalation domestically and abroad. And dialogue is important, but dialogue should also be realistic and have its limits. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Hvala vama, gospodine Milov, na veoma... Again, good to have you in our Foreign Affairs Committee meeting. We now come to our second speaker, and we will connect with Washington, D.C., with Ambassador Daniel Fried, who many of us, of course, know and who many of us have enjoyed in a number of different formats and events. Ambassador Fried is a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council as well as a member of the Board of Directors of the U.S. National Endowment for Democracy, and he is also a visiting professor at Warsaw University. Mr. Fried knows Europe very well. He was American ambassador to Poland and assistant secretary of state for Europe from 2005 to 2009. I have asked him to speak about the EU policy towards Russia from an American perspective and how to make it more effective through transatlantic cooperation. Dear Ambassador, dear Dan, welcome to the Foreign Affairs Committee. The floor is yours. Please press the speak button. I welcome the chance to testify before the the committee, and it is a pleasure to be on a panel um, with, among others, Vladimir Milov, with whom I am in substantial agreement. Our topic is the EU's long-term strategy toward Russia, but I will discuss also what a common and consistent EU, US, and UK long-term strategy should be. Because if we, Europe and the United States, don't forge a common approach, we're all apt to end up worse. It's a good time for such a discussion because at last, the US president likes Europe and wants to work with it and also has long experience with Russia, as does his senior national security team. What are we dealing with in Putin's Russia? Russia is a stagnating authoritarian kleptocracy led by a president for life who started wars against his neighbors, assassinates opponents inside and outside of Russia, interferes in European and US elections, engages in lethal sabotage inside European countries like Czechia, and acts as an anti-democratic 
an anti-U.S. spoiler at every opportunity. Putin expects the West to grant Russia a free hand in what it claims is its half of Europe, and to look the other way when the Kremlin seeks to deprive its former neighbors and its own citizens of the right to chart their own future. This reflects a deeper dilemma in Russia. Its political authoritarianism at home brings economic stagnation that in turn generates insecurity, including a lack of confidence in Russia's ability to attract willing allies. Under Putin, like Soviet leaders, Russia's position in its region and even the world, therefore, relies on subversion, corruption, disinformation, intimidation, and sometimes violence to subordinate sovereign states to its will. The Kremlin's aggression abroad comes from its repression at home. This has been in, on display in recent weeks. A military buildup against Ukraine accompanied by threatening rhetoric, attempted intimidation against Czechia after that country protested sabotage by Russian security services that killed Czech citizens, and actions against Bulgaria and other EU member states, hostile posturing against the EU, including Foreign Minister Lavrov's ambush of High Representative Borrell in Moscow, and visa sanctions against senior EU officials, including Parliament President Sassoli and Commissioner Jourova, and other officials from EU member states. Why? Because Europe took exception to Kremlin attempts to murder a dissident, Alexei Navalny, and other forms of internal repression. We have seen a tightening of Kremlin repression at home. And Europe and the United States must expect continued difficulties with the Kremlin in the short term at least. We should not, however, assume that current tensions with the Kremlin are the only possible state of relations. In my view, our policy toward Russia must contend with difficulties now with the aim of a better state of relations that is possible in the future. What do we do? Well, let's start with where we are in setting a policy framework, and let's consider the baseline EU policy toward Russia, which I'll define as the five guiding principles from March 2016. To recall, these include full implementation of the Minsk agreements, in other words, Russia giving back to Ukrainian sovereign control of the Donbass, closer ties with Russia's, with Russia's former Soviet neighbors, strengthening EU resilience to Russian threats, selective engagement with Russia on certain issues like counterterrorism, and support for people-to-people -people contacts. Now that's not a bad framework. It acknowledges the centrality of Kremlin aggression against Ukraine. It implicitly rejects condominium with Putin that would give him a sphere of domination over the former Soviet Union. And it acknowledges the existence of Russian threats. In that context, selective engagement with the Kremlin on certain issues is a sound approach. As Vladimir Milov said, it's certainly a sounder practice than attempts to elevate cooperation with Russia to the paramount place. Support for people-to-people -people contact sounds banal, but it isn't. As we found before 1989, exchanges, outreach, all kinds of such initiatives have a long-term impact that grows. Putin seeks to curtail them for that reason. Now this framework could be strengthened by explicit recognition of the importance of democracy in Russia. To answer those who object that Europe and the United States should not speak of Russian internal developments, I would say that we should frame this in terms of democratic obligations that Russia has already accepted for itself. For example, in the Charter of Paris that helped end the Cold War. Now, I understand that the existing framework is not the whole story. And I understand that there are in Europe a range of views about Russia. There are inconsistencies. There are attempts in some circles in Europe and in the United States to act as if Putin is a victim or misunderstood. My point, however, is that the EU policy framework for Russia is a good enough foundation on which we can build and on which the EU is building with its new strategy, given the 
Kremlin's current aggressive stance. For its part, the Biden administration has made a solid start in framing up a sustainable Russia policy consistent with the European policy. Its elements include no reset and no escalation if Putin makes that possible. Cooperation, where possible, as in arms control, climate change, maybe the Arctic, push back against aggression. That already includes the Biden administration sanctions package and executive order of April 15th and the coordinated U.S. government response to Russia's military buildup against Ukraine. If Putin wanted to determine whether the new U.S. administration was asleep or disorganized, he got his answer. It isn't. Secretary of State Tony Blinken's May trip to Ukraine just last week showed welcome support for that country. The final element is to offer dialogue on, but on our terms. The offer of a meeting between Biden and Putin is a good tactic. It gives the Americans flexibility without attempting to defend such a meeting in non-credible terms. The frankness of President Biden's language about Putin makes a meeting possible. Not surprising that the team has made a good start. President Biden, Secretary Blinken, Toria Newland all have extensive experience with Russia and with Central and Eastern Europe. They do not see Ukraine or Poland or the Baltics through a Russian perspective. Now, what's the way ahead? Sadly, the most important element of a transatlantic approach to Russia will be to resist Kremlin aggression, to support Ukraine while pushing Ukraine on its own domestic transformation. We need to maintain and strengthen NATO deployments. And I welcome President Biden's participation in the Bucharest hosted NATO, a uh, Bucharest nine meeting of NATO leaders happening today. We need to up our game on counter disinformation. We need to reduce Kremlin energy leverage over Europe. We need to reduce the scope for corrupt flows of Russian money and increase transparency. No more hidden or disguised investments. And please, can we get, consider curtailing the practice of Russian, Russians buying Western citizenship? Putin may have backed off his threat to launch a new offense, military offensive against Ukraine, but such aggression or aggression in other forms may continue and intensify we must be ready and we must let the Kremlin know that we are ready to respond to and hopefully thereby deter further Russian aggression. There are, by the way, plenty of sanctions options should Putin's aggression continue. Sectoral sanctions in the financial and energy areas and individual sanctions against those responsible for aggression and Putin's circle of cronies. The US and EU together started imposing sanctions against Putin's cronies and agents in 2014. We should be prepared to escalate sanctions if Putin's aggression continues. We also need to be prepared to remove sanctions. For example, if we reach a settlement that restores the Donbass to Ukrainian sovereignty. To those who reject sanctions as confrontational, I would point out that Putin is the aggressor. We are under no obligation to make it easy for Putin to make or place money in the West while he attacks the West. And we should, in any case, increase restrictions on money laundering and other forms of corruption. Do sanctions work? Sanctions have diminished Russia's economic growth and therefore may have limited the Kremlin's resources from malign behavior. A second pillar of the Biden, emerging Biden-Russia strategy is to cooperate with Russia where possible. We should not hesitate to do so. The Biden administration made an early wise decision to extend the New START Strategic Arms Control Treaty. Other forms of cooperation are possible, but we should keep our expectations under control. A third pillar is to seek to stabilize the relationship. 
military to military dialogue from top to bottom. A fourth pillar is long-term investment in better relations with Russia and with Russian society as a whole and the Russian people. Opportunities have shrunk and they may vanish if Putin has his way, but let's be creative. Let's find ways to reach out and support free media and digital communities in Russia. Human rights are not a peripheral luxury. Developments inside Russia are important. No, I'm not talking about regime change, but I'm not talking about indifference. Above all, we should not accept the inevitability of tyranny. So to sum up, what are the do's and don'ts in dealing with Putin's Russia? It's not a creative time yet in our relations with Russia. It's a time for steadiness. So do keep expectations under control. Let's not be extravagant in what we think we can achieve with Putin. Do work together with Russia where we can, but don't bring the Kremlin unrequited gifts. Don't make concessions in the name of dialogue unless the Kremlin is doing something to merit it. Don't fall for the fallacy of assuming that we need to buy Russian support against China at the cost of our principles or our friends. That's an amateur's fallacy and won't end well. Do keep our powder dry. In other words, be prepared, pre prepared for Putinist adventurism or volunteerism as the Soviets used to say. Don't fall for cliches about Russia, such as the endless capacity of Russians' uh, ability to suffer for the sake of the state, or that Russians were, are somehow always authoritarian by nature. That is cli those are cliches. Let's not shortchange the potential for positive change in Russia. Do consider the potential for better times ahead. Who in 1982 anticipated Gorbachev? Russian history for decades has been marked by discontinuities, not straight line development. We must keep that in mind. Resisting Kremlin aggression now may set the stage for better relations, our goal in the future. A final point, do work together, the United States with Europe and the UK. Putin is looking to divide us. He is looking to pit us against each other. That is another excellent argument not to do so. We are stronger together. Our values, our interests are ultimately interdependent and one, and together we can succeed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you, Daniel Fried, for this American perspective. And now we move on to our third and final panelist, and this is Mr. Nico Popescu. He is the director of the wider Europe program at the European Council on Foreign Relations, and he also served in 2019 as a minister of foreign affairs and European integration of the Republic of Moldova. Mr. Popescu's presentation will be about the achievements and also the shortcomings of our EU policy towards Russia and how should the EU shape its relations with Russia in the future. Dear Nico Popescu, the floor is yours for 15 minutes. Mr. Popescu, please press the speak button. Does this work now? Hello. Yes, we can see you, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to see you, uh, to see you, David and Vladimir and Dan. And I will start by saying that by watching news about uh, relations between the European Union and Russia and developments in Russia, we see, of course, that relations are growing tense almost by the day. Uh, recent years have been dominated by negative news of sanctions, diplomatic incidents and mutual expulsions, uh, ten tensions and military build-ups around Ukraine, uh, cyber attacks attributed to Russia, now explosions of weapon depots on European Union territory attributed to Russia. And I think they have been, you know, pretty depressing 
they have been speaking of pretty depressing trends, uh, both for the security of the European continent and for EU-Russia relations. But I would like to also stress that this is only half of the picture, because if we look at what is uh, reported much less uh, on, in, in the news, I would say that in the last decade, a bit more, the European Union and the West at large with the United States and Canada have actually already been engaged in a pretty systematic and profound strategic accommodation of Russia. If you go back and reread uh, the speech of Vladimir Putin in Munich in 2016, and you would think about those uh, Russian concerns that he voiced back at the time, and you think of what is happening today, you would probably discover that most of the Russian concerns from 10, 14 years ago have already been de facto addressed. De facto, uh, NATO's enlargement to Ukraine and Georgia has been frozen, it de facto stopped. Uh, the Western policies of humanitarian interventions have again stopped a decade ago already, and that was a uh, another source of major Russian irritation uh, a decade or more ago. Uh, if you look at what Western leaders uh, and the way they talk about domestic developments in Russia, then you would see that they are much less critical and much less frequently raising concerns about democratic developments than, than even um, you know, 20 years ago President Chirac would do. We have seen a recent spike in criticism towards, towards Russia because of the Navalny affairs, but actually in the last decade, Western leaders have been criticizing less and less Russia for the state of its domestic politics. We see Nord Stream 2 being built. Uh, Russia was readmitted to the Parliamentary um, Assembly of the Council of Europe two years ago. Uh, we have seen in the last decade or so six reset offers. Uh, given and, you know, uh, offered to Russia and Russia chose not to pick up fundamentally none of them. And those reset offers I will very briefly list that is Clinton's reset, Meserberg, the Partnership for Modernization, the Selective Engagement Offer from the Five Principles, the post Bregansson Diplomacy and Borrell's recent trip to Moscow. And we see quite a lot of selective engagement happening in the last few years. Uh, Russian gas exports to the European Union have been beating historical records. They were around 200 billion cubic meters, and that's more than ever before in history. Uh, and there are many things that uh, you know could be uh, mentioned to show that EU-Russia uh, cooperation continues. So I would say that in the last decade, uh, this profound strategic accommodation of Russian interests has not been matched either by Russia being more reassured about the West, either by Russia being more positive about the West, and to a large extent Russia has not uh, paid in kind uh, these uh, multiple trends through which the European Union and NATO and the United States have been uh, accommodating Russian strategic concerns. In recent years we of course have the situation and the war in Ukraine, including the latest military build-up. We have highly disruptive Russian actions uh, highly disruptive for the European Union interests in Libya, in Syria, in the Central African Republic, and even in the Balkans, we have seen uh, more and more Russian policies designed to weaken the European Union, especially in Serbia uh, and Bosnia. Uh, if we try to understand where we are in terms of European Union, you know, the, the effectiveness of what the European Union has been trying to do vis-a-vis -vis Russia in recent years, then I would again um, support what Dan uh, has mentioned, and that is the fact that uh, the sanctions policy, they of course have had several positive effects for the European Union. They of course have not been very good for EU-Russia dialogue, but they nonetheless helped Europe to achieve several important uh, European interests. And uh, the first and most important, I would say, is the fact that partly thanks to sanctions, uh, I think uh, the degree of Russian military presence and intervention into Ukraine in 2014-15 has been uh, much smaller than if there were no European sanctions. And partly because of that, the war zone in Ukraine is also smaller and the war has been shorter. 
European sanctions and American sanctions, of course, on Russia had also effects on Russia's military modernization program, both on a tactical level in making it more complicating for Russia to modernize uh, by using specific technologies, but also if you look at Russia, the direct effect of sanctions, but sanctions have created um, have created a situation where Russia has been much more careful about the way it spends money, be it uh, on military modernization, be it in foreign policy or in other domains. Uh, a small footnote on the foreign policy elements of, of, uh, of Russia's access to cash. If you look actually at Russian um, uh, national, um, if you look at Russia's um, you know, policy of saving money, you would see that in recent years, the National Wealth Fund has been increasing. So on that level, one could not say that Russia significantly suffered or, you know, had short term negative effects for its economy uh, that would make it change its policy. But at the same time, I do notice uh, some important areas where Russia has been saving uh, and reducing the costs of its foreign policy. And we have also we have seen that in uh, across multiple post-Soviet states where Russia has been offering less and less subsidies to countries, be it to Belarus and Lukashenko in, in recent years. There was not a lot of financial generosity when it comes to uh, loans or gas prices to uh, President Yanukovych when he was in Ukraine. And generally, we have seen Russia trying to save funds from large scale investments in partner countries uh, and has there has been a trend of trying up uh, trying to save funds for potentially uh, rainy domestic days uh, and to me this also suggests that Russia is you know in a process of accumulating something of a war chest uh, for its uh, conversation with West that in Russian mind might last quite a long time possibly one or two decades or more. Um, we've seen also being um, uh, both, both facing the good and Nico Popescu, I'm sorry that we have lost you. You're no longer connected. Could somebody from the services try to? phone Mr. Popescu or send him an email or something? Please press the speak button, sir. So, uh, dear Mr. Popescu, I'm very sorry, but uh, unfortunately, we can no longer hear or see you. Um, I would suggest that uh, we uh, move on, and I now give the floor to the members according to the speakers list. But first of all, let me thank all three of our panelists uh, for their interventions. That was very interesting and very helpful. Colleagues, we now have about 20 minutes time for our interventions and then I would like to conclude with our panelists with their statements referring to what each of us has said. So I will have to be very strict on speaking time. It's one and a half minutes each. Please be precise and I have to be very strict. I'm sorry. I first give the floor to the chair of our standing delegation with the Russian Federation, Richard Shanetsky. Thank you, Chair. Uh, dear Chairman, dear colleagues, dear speakers, um, the EU reactions to the Russian 2014 
legal annexation of the Crimea Peninsula and the beginning of its support to the Donbas rebels were quick, quick and proportionate. Then you the five guiding principles and on how to interact with Russia were appropriate. The respect of this principle and the renewal of the sanctions over the years have been a success for the EU external policy. New challenges emerging from Russia, like the construction of the bridge over the Kerch Strait, the unacceptable behaviour of the Azov Sea and disrespect of fundamental rights often implemented when outside Russia have been met with new types of EU sanctions, including the global human rights sanctioned regime. My straight question to the guest speaker uh, would be what uh, other measures would you propose to deal with an increasingly threatening Russia? Would personal sanction to President Putin's inner circle of political economic elite make the trick as the Russian true opposition asked us to adopt? And finally, also, uh, or would such sanction cross Russian red lines that may trigger a dangerous confrontation? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Richard Shanetsky. And now I give the floor to our standing rapporteur on Russia, Andreas Kabilius. Well, thanks a lot, Mr. Chairman. And uh, dear, dear colleagues, uh, Vladimir, Dan, Nico, really thanks a lot for your, for your presence and your statements, despite maybe Kremlin attempts you know, to use cyber attacks against uh, this very important hearing. Kremlin really is a major security threat uh, for the whole world and especially for EU, both externally and internally. Push back, contain and engage with, I would call, pro-democratic society. That should be our strategy towards Russia. Democracy in Russia would be the best answer to the most important question, how to diminish threats of Russia, which we see now. But there is the biggest challenge, in some way connected with uh, what Vladimir Milov described, EU inaction. You know, that was a very precise description. Kremlin is using all the propaganda and tries to convince everybody in the West that democracy is not possible in Russia. Because if democracy is not possible, then the only way for the West is to accommodate to Putin's Russia. That is the hope of Putin. It is very clear that among us, there are some who still do not believe that democracy in Russia is possible. Of course, we need to keep our expectations rational, but when we are looking to the future of Russia, we need to have a very clear answer. Do we believe in democracy or we are accommodating? My question to speakers, what would be your answer to those in the West who still do not believe that democracy is possible in Russia? Thank you, Andreas. So now we come to the representatives of the groups, and we kick off with Michael Gala for the EPP. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I think the dialogue options have been mentioned, arms control, the JCPOA, perhaps on the climate issues, although there is question marks uh, with regard to Russia's contribution in this regard. Uh, the question is how far, I would say, we can coordinate our action with the US. I think uh, that would be advisable. Uh, on individual sanctions, do you... Mr. Popescu, Mr. Fried, see the possibility and willingness to, to really coordinate uh, also on the, on the individual persons uh, in, in, in this regard. Uh, when, when it comes to uh, reducing the energy dependence, uh, our American friends, have they not recently bought a lot of oil from Russia in comparison to earlier times? So uh, I hear the... the points with regard to Europe, and I'm an outspoken critic of North Stream 2, that's not a doubt, but uh, then these uh, actions should be simultaneous in, in, in getting there, also for our uh, American friends. And how far can we really assess uh, what Putin's uh, intentions are ahead of the uh, uh, Duma elections and thereafter. Is it a dependence on how he will react on the outcome? I mean, he knows how the real uh, opinion is. Um, and can we uh, really properly react also on, on a, an arms show of force, as we have seen with Ukraine very recently? Do we have, should we show our uh, instruments that we have already now and not leave him in the unclear? Thank you. Thank you. 
Tonino Pizzola for the S&D. Thank you, Chair, and thank to all panelists. Yes, it's easy to conclude that our relations with Russia are at a very low point. The President of this House is persona non grata in Russia together with the EU Commissioner. We see the latest worrying news on the death of doctors who treated Alexei Navalny. These attacks illustrate the shrinking space for democracy, rule of law and fundamental freedoms, while human rights situation in Russia is deteriorating on an unprecedented scale. Illegal activities in Czech Republic are a stark reminder of how far does Russia interference go. I welcome the hearing today as we have to adopt a new substantial and comprehensive strategy towards Russia without a delay. We should not keep falling into political traps, further narrowing space for our political actions, but rather strengthen our common foreign and security policy. Energy over dependence, divergent policies of the member states, direct interference in political processes, and Russia's very active role in disinformation campaigns should be on our to-do list. Prevailing particular interests are only a great opportunity for Russia to impose further leverage. Therefore, we should re-examine the added value of the ongoing policies and projects that undermine strategic autonomy of the European Union as a whole. In our view, leadership comes with responsibility, and we obviously don't observe such responsible global leadership from Russia for the moment. Quite the contrary. My question to panelists, how can we make the best use of transatlantic cooperation both to contain Russia's malign actions more effectively, as well as to anchor Russia more firmly and narrowly in multilateral institutions and constructive cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Hilde Woutmans, please. Madam Woutmans, please. Thank you very much, Chair. And thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Unfortunately, over the past weeks, we saw that Russia's responsible behavior continued. We have repeatedly called on Russian leaders to respect the country's own international commitments and its constitution, which guarantees freedom of speech. And what was the reaction? Further confrontational behavior. No even sanctions against the president, like other colleagues said, president of our parliament and other EU leaders. We cannot allow such attempts to organize the EU institutions and throw this to silence and divide us. We are, of course, interested to have stable relations with Russia. It's our biggest neighbor. We continue to trade and we have to deal with Russia to address common challenges, such as climate change or arms control. But we should never be naive about it. And we should say clearly that relations will not improve if the Kremlin continues on this path. Today, we discuss a long-term long -term strategy towards Russia. I think it's clear to everybody that relations are unlikely to improve very soon, unfortunately. So we'll need to be steadfast in the defense of our values, our security and our interests to continue to stand up for international law, for democracy and human rights. We'll need to strengthen our own resilience and that of our partners to deal with and deter Russians' unfriendly behavior. The EU recently started to use the European Magnitsky Act, which I welcome but need to further strengthen such tools and to extend our sanctioned regimes to deal with corruptions. Thinking about the long term, it's my vision we really should invest in the future of our relations with the Russian people, because I'm very, very worried about a whole generation of young Russians who grow up with anti-European feelings. So for me, that's really important that we can open the relationship with Russia and that we don't build up all generations of Russian with anti-European things. Thank you very much. Thank you for the ID group, Jack Madison. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for all the speakers also. I have only a few questions. First of all, about the energy policy um, with Russia. The, the official position of the German government is that it's only economical relation and there is nothing to do with the politics. But of course, in my opinion, it's a very weak argument because it cannot never be 
energy cooperation without politics. It's always uh, with the politics. Uh, with a former president of the US, Mr. Trump, uh, there was a very clear position. Uh, they made sanctions against the, against the companies who built it, who tried to build up the Nord Stream 2. Uh, what is the position now uh, for Mr. Biden? Uh, are they going forward with the sanctions uh, or, or very hard line against the Nord Stream 2? Same question for Mr. Milov as a former deputy minister of energy in Russia about 20 years ago. What is your position uh, in Nord Stream 2? Uh, what will be like the outcome? if there will be like harder policy from the US in the cooperation with the EU. Uh, the second thing what I would like to mention is that sometimes uh, the politicians in the Western Europe uh, are trying to hold apart the government of Russia from the ordinary people of Russia. I would like to remind that, uh, okay, there can be also like the fake numbers, but still there is a huge support, unfortunately, to the Russian government. And if I even saw like the thousands of people yesterday in, in Tallinn, where they are going to celebrate so-called victory uh, for the Second World War, uh, I don't have really big hope uh, that the Russian ordinary people will come closer to the EU or the US. So the question is that uh, how you see the policy actions from the new president of the US, Mr. Biden, and I hope it will be the outcome of the Nord Stream 2. Thank you so much. Thank you. I now give the floor to Sergei Lagodinsky for Greens. Thank you very much, and my solidarity with uh, um, our guests, and especially with uh, guests from Russia who are subjected to um, unjustifiable and terrible persecution. Um, uh, I wanted to emphasize that, of course, our position uh, should remain that people to people and support for civil society is the cornerstone of our relationship. Yet we need to spell out what our strategy actually go, uh, means beyond that. And uh, my concern, and this is a question maybe to Dan, is the danger of our promise. What I've been seeing here is that uh, precisely what, what Mr. Milov mentioned, that the parliament has had very ambitious plans and other institutions of the EU do not follow up on them. So the question is uh, how to limit the danger and the damage of overpromising when we want to be ambitious but we need to be realistic in what we can do. Uh, number two, also to Dan, uh, I think that the transatlantic coordination is the absolute necessity now. But the problem is that, for example, with sanctions, what I'm seeing is that the flexibility of the European Union in imposing sanctions is much lower than that of the, Europe, of the United States, because we are over-bureaucratized, etc., etc. How should we go about that? Uh, I think we should reform the EU foreign policy uh, um, area, but this is a long-term goal. Uh, so what do we do be before that? And the two other points, anti-corruption and uh, uh, sharing and working together on technological standards internationally and globally, this is something that I think is important also to, to see um, what are the chances there in cooperating regarding technological standards vis-à-vis -vis <laughs> regimes like Russia or China. Thank you very much, Sergei Lagodinsky. And now for the ECR group, I give the floor to our colleague, Asita Kanko. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Um, Moscow's behavior demands a response from the EU, not just words, but actions. Unfortunately, unfortunately, until now, we've seen a lot of words and little action. There is a common thread in all of Putin's activities. Navalny's detention, the conflict in Ukraine and other frozen conflicts like Georgia, disinformation and election meddling, cyber attacks, deploying chemical weapons in the UK, and attack on an ammunition warehouse in Chechia. They are all part of Putin's campaign to protect his corrupt regime and destabilize and divide the free world. President Biden may have handled his first major test on Russia, but the EU failed yet again. Our foreign ministers use words when actions are demanded. Our high representative spread his own disinformation about Russian troops in Ukraine. The time has come for us to stand up to Putin, to rethink our strategic approach to Nord Stream 2, for example, to target Putin's cronies and their illicit funds, and to show solidarity with Chechia by imposing further sanctions. Appeasement only never works. We need a more realistic approach. My questions to the panel are the following. Putin's response, response to strength. How do you believe the EU should show its own strength? What do you believe needs to be adjusted in the EU's diplomacy with Russia? 
is there still the danger that, al that although the EU has adopted the European Magnitsky Act, that member states will still be hesitant to use it and how do we overcome this? And finally, what more do you believe the EU should be doing to create an effective and expedient sanctions policy? Thank you. Thank you, dear Asita Kanko. And now I give the floor to Mick Wallace for the left. Thank you very much, David. After reading the draft report on the direction of EU-Russia relations, I can only come to the conclusion that there are elements in the European Parliament that do not want any relations between the EU and Russia, and that they don't believe in diplomacy or peace. How can the European Parliament be taken seriously when it issues resolutions and reports of this nature? It's pure escalation and belligerence, full of unfounded assumptions and divorced from reality. And some of it, like the passages on sanctions, is calling for the violation of international law. The UN principle of non-interference in the affairs of another sovereign country is completely abandoned. The document calls for setting up propaganda outlets inside Russia. It's also setting up uh, for getting ready for calling Russia's uh, next elections fraudulent. It wants a democratic transformation of Russia. This is like a, a regime change uh, document. We should have sane relations, facts-based relations, respectful relations with our neighbours. My questions. Ambassador, you spoke about Russian interference, but the Atlantic Council and the National Endowment for Democracy engage in propaganda to further US interests. Is that not US interference? Secondly, you say the EU should resist, resist Russian aggression. But Ambassador, the US and NATO have been encroaching on Russian borders for years now, despite the promise by Garbage, to Gorbachev. How can you say that Russia are more aggressive than the US? Russia are not encroaching on the borders of the US. And lastly, would you not agree that US efforts to drive a wedge between the EU and Russia and China is not just an effort to isolate uh, Russia and China, but an, an effort to make the EU more dependent on the US. Thanks. Thank you. For the non inscri Martin Janjeshi. Thank you, Chair. Listening to the US position uh, put forward by Daniel Fried, uh, it is crystal clear. Uh, nonetheless, when I look at the three-pronged strategy of the EU, I have some serious doubts and some serious questions, especially when we are talking about pushing back where we see a threat. I don't see who is going to define where the red line is. We say in the, in the third uh, element of this strategy, we say engage with Russia in areas where we have an interest to do so. Who on earth is going to define that? Is the Nord Stream or is the Paksh uh, nuclear power plant project, is that the interest of the European Union or is that just the mere interest of a single member state? Uh, so I'm curious to know who in the EU strategy defines the red lines and the interests. Uh, on a more practical note, um, recently the foundation of uh, Mr. Navalny has been classified as a terrorist organization. All the supporters uh, of his foundation are intimidated, discouraged, kept away from practicing their basic human rights. Recently, a splinter web portal of the very popular Russian website, Lenta, a website called Medusa, has been expelled from Russia. It is currently operating from the territory of the EU, from Riga, from Latvia. And it has been classified as a foreign agent, stigmatizing its sponsors, its readers, its journalists alike. If you compare that with the NGOs operating in Hungary at the moment under the Orban regime, it is quite a familiar um, uh, method. What can the EU do to protect those that uphold its values in Russia and within the EU? Thank you. Colleagues, I will conclude our round of remarks by our MEPs at five minutes past three because I want to give our panellists at least some time to respond. So let's see how far we can get. I have six more speakers. So then we move on to Bernard Guetta and he's in the room. So, he can't be cut off. Merci, uh, c'est bon. Thank you, Chair. My first question is to um, Ambassador. I would like to ask of him what he thinks President Putin hopes of his upcoming summit with President Biden. We all noted 
that instead of refusing this meeting, he accepted it with notable speed indeed. In your opinion, why was that? Why? What is he hoping of the meeting? Second question to Ambassador Field and to Mr. Milov. Is the EU, in you, your eyes, and the US too, would it, they have an interest today in addressing themselves directly above Putin's head to the Russian population to propose to them coexistence and cooperation that we all are hoping to achieve with Russia? Thank you to both of you. Thank you. Dietmar Köster. Yeah, vielen Dank, Herr Vorsitzender. Thank you, Chair. The speakers mentioned above all that because of the massive human rights violations in Russia and because of the annex of Crimea and eastern Ukraine against international law, that the escalation, we need to engage in escalation towards Russia. But the question is, what way out is there out of this escalation strategy? And what is the end point of this escalation? What is the end point? If we continue down the road of escalation, the site newspaper said that there, would, there wouldn't be any moral obligation anywhere to keep peace with Russia. So what's the end point? I think in the EU, we need to consider to what extent we need to consider Russia's security interests. And I have a big concern that because of the NATO Eastern expansion and because of the amassing of troops of Russia at the Eastern European borders, that through technical errors, through errors, then we might end up with military escalations in these areas where NATO and Russian troops are getting closer and closer together. If we want to secure peace in Europe, then we need to consider very closely how we really get out of this spiral of escalation to maintain peace in Europe. That can only be secured together with Europe, working together with Europe, not just against them. It's five minutes past three. I'm sorry, I will have to close our speakers list now. And we go back to our panelists. And we begin now first with Mr. Popescu, who was kicked out of his connection. Let's see if you can reconnect now. And it's five minutes maximum. I hope this works. Thank you very much. Uh, I apologize, but our technologies don't keep. Um, anyway, so on. First of all, I would like to, you know, make one historical point. Uh, Gorbachev himself said that he did not request, and of course, he did not receive any promises that NATO will not, will not enlarge. So this story is fake. Uh, there is no better source to me than Gorbachev, and there was no such promise not to enlarge NATO, according to Gorbachev. Two, uh, whether uh, European Union hum human rights language on events in Russia uh, serve any purpose. Probably this will not be uh, enough and will not change the dynamic of the Russian political system, but it is incredibly important for maintaining uh, at least a minimal degree of, of uh, perhaps if not security, but at least it limits the danger to which some people are exposed. And of course, Vladimir is here and he can tell us more, but without international attention to the human rights situation in Russia, things would probably be worse. Uh, climate change. Uh, very often climate change is seen as a potential platform on which the EU and Russia could engage in deeper selective engagement. And I think there is a degree of potential for that. But we should also be aware that probably before it will lead to more selective engagement, it will probably lead to more tensions. Uh, in Russia, there is more awareness of climate change issues than five or ten years ago. But at the same time, in Russia, there is a fear that the European dynamic 
uh, to boost climate change policies, the carbon adjustment mechanism will hit uh, Russian interest in a pretty aggressive manner. So it is quite likely that the pursuit of uh, European goals regarding climate change uh, might also become soon enough another source of tension between the EU and Russia, and we should not only see climate change as offering us a potential for uh, a selective engagement. Um, and then the question regarding the escalation strategy in relations with Moscow, I already mentioned, but if you look at what the European Union and the United States have been doing in the last decade, that has mostly been a de-escalation strategy. Uh, George Bush was much more ambitious and assertive vis-a-vis -vis Russia than Barack Obama, than Donald Trump, and to my mind, than Joseph Biden today. Uh, so it's already the third US president that has been uh, speaking less of human rights issues in Russia, that has been not pushing for NATO enlargement to Georgia and Ukraine, uh, and doing many more things to accommodate Russian strategic interests and concerns, including in Eastern Europe. And the problem I think the European Union have and the United States is that this strategic accommodation of Russia has not helped improve relations. So what is the way forward? I think the way forward is, in a sense, the way forward in strengthening Europe. And that means, of course, more solidarity, even on issues like uh, mutual coordination of diplomatic expulsions. Whenever the Europeans act together, they limit the degree of assertiveness of other powers vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. And that's not only about Russia, that can also be about Turkey, about China, uh, about Iran, and many other countries. Uh, the second element, I think it's important for, Europe, for the European Union to consolidate its own security capacities and stick to the need to face and to maintain defense spending at, at, a, at a level that makes Europe respected and influential in, its, in security in the European neighborhood. And with COVID, that's far from being uh, guaranteed. And I would say that it's important for the European Union to start developing security partnerships with uh, selected neighbors in the Eastern Partnership, some of them being also in the Western Balkans. And it's important for the European Union to, to build up a network of proto-alliances of partnerships on security, on defense, on intelligence issues with countries like Serbia, which is a candidate country, with countries like Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, but also in the Middle East, there's several other partners. Only a more influential Europe will be taken more seriously by Russia, but also by other powers. And I will stop here, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Deku Popescu. Dan Fried, please, your comments, five minutes. There are a number of interesting questions. I will try to address as many as I can, and I will be brief and terse, forgive me. Um, from my old friend Richard Charnetsky, uh, we should go after Putin's circle of cronies. The United States and Europe started doing so in 2014. Um, we ought to consider doing so again. In sanctions policy, there has been a debate and continues to be a debate as to whether we should focus on individual sanctions or sectoral sanctions. Um, this is a serious discussion. The United States and Europe have done both. Um, there is considerable room for escalation uh, should Putin's aggression increase. And we need to coordinate with each other and discuss this with, um, the Russian, with Russians whom we respect and trust. Um, is democracy possible in Russia? Yes, I do not and have never accepted the view that somehow Russia is um, inevitably determined to be authoritarian. This is a cliche about Russia. It used to be applied to Germany. It used to be applied to Japan. It used to be applied to Catholic countries in Europe. This is prejudice back from the 19th century. Enough. There is a history of Russian democratic and liberal movements. It has been a minority history, but I cannot look at Vladimir Milov and Vladimir Karamurza and say that they do not represent Russia. They in fact represent a long-standing Russian tradition of liberalism. Yeltsin got close. The next attempt may succeed. Um, the question of Nord Stream 2, um, 
First of all, the problem is not buying Russian gas or the U.S. buying Russian oil. The problem with Nord Stream 2 is that it divides Europe into preferred customers like Germany who, that can be supplied directly by Nord Stream 2 and less favored customers like the Central European members of NATO and Ukraine who then could be cut off by use of Nord Stream 2 and curtailment of other pipelines. That, in a nutshell, is the problem of Nord Stream 2. What is the Biden administration prepared to do about it? Well, I don't know, but they, they start with the premise that Nord Stream 2 is a bad idea. They're right. They also believe, as far as I can tell, that sanctions to kill it are an expensive way to kill it. Are there ways to mitigate the risks of Nord Stream 2, to undermine Putin's attempt to use it as a strategic lever against Europe? Is this possible? Um, possibly. Um, I have some sympathy for recent German calls for a moratorium on U.S. sanctions and a moratorium on further construction of Nord Stream 2 to give us all time to think and come up with potential solutions. So Nord Stream 2 is a bad idea. I don't know where the Biden administration will come out, but I hope that we should remember that Germany is not the problem. Putin is the problem. The German government made a mistake in Nord Stream 2, but we ought to work with Germany to, to try to help get out of it. Um, with respect, of course the United States never promised not to enlarge NATO. Um, Mr. Pope, Minister Popescu is absolutely right. And secondly, I fail to see why we should have perpetuated the division and the division of Europe after the Cold War had ended and consigned the Baltic states or Central Europe to a gray zone. Putin wants to control the former Soviet sphere of domination. That is not a reason for us to allow him. Do these people, 100 million Europeans, or 140 million Europeans, if you include Ukraine, which is a European country, do they have the right to determine their own future? Um, does, what does it mean to, to work directly with the Russian people? And it means that as with all countries, we need to conduct diplomacy, not just with governments, but we need to reach out to societies. That is not interference. That is the way civilized countries behave. I see no reason to respect the authoritarian claim that a free press is a threat at home and free exchange of ideas across borders is somehow interference. Um, I don't believe that, never have. Um, I applaud, final point, I applaud the high degree of consensus I'm sensing from the European parliamentarians on the need for a, a balanced, sustainable, and stronger policy of, reduce, of resisting Putin's aggression while cooperating with Russia in areas where it is possible to do so. This is something we can build on working together, and I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Dan Fried, for your statement. And finally, Mr. Milov, for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman and members of the European Parliament, for this uh, thoughtful discussion. I'll just briefly run through some questions which uh, were asked. Uh, first, I wanted to comment on this sovereign country part, uh, that Russia is a sovereign country. It is not. We should clearly understand that modern-day Russia is not a sovereign country. It is occupied by mafia, which was never elected by anyone. Eight out of 13 permanent members of the National Security Council, the body which effectively determines domestic and foreign policy, as you can see on the Kremlin's website, they have a weekly meetings where they decide everything. Eight out of 13 members were never elected to public post by nobody. The remaining five were elected sometime like 20 years ago, less time and more or less free and fair election, but... That was a different era back then. So uh, is sovereignty means power of the people. When the population of the country actually runs the country and determines its policy. None of that is happening in modern day Russia. Before the state Duma elections that are scheduled for uh, September, all of the opposition has been arrested or kicked out or declared extremists so they cannot uh, participate. 
Is that a sovereign country? It doesn't occur to me so. So that's an important point which should be also uh, bear in mind when we discuss this regime change rhetoric, when, which is uh, parroting what the Kremlin propaganda is saying. Uh, and uh, another important issue is uh, Nord Stream 2, which is a matter of heated debate always in these chambers. Very simple. What Nord Stream 2 uh, does it only adds some extreme excessive surplus capacity to the system of uh, Russian pipelines exporting the gas uh, to Europe. If Nord Stream 2 will never be built, you Europeans will still have plenty of ability to get Russian gas imported. It's still available with or without Nord Stream 2. Nord Stream 2 will just add extreme uh, excessive capacity at our expense at the expense of a Russian taxpayer, uh, we have wasted over 10 billion euros for building this thing and it makes me really angry when I think about uh, useful things which uh, should have been done with that money instead, uh, doing something for the Russian people, not for uh, Putin's cronies. So uh, on Putin's cronies, the important thing is uh, what, what Europe can do uh, to show its strength. Uh, here's where uh, my colleagues have mentioned uh, sanctioning uh, Putin's oligarchs and enablers. This is a very important part. We're not just talking about some individuals uh, uh, who might get on the sanctions list and uh, uh, there will be some political consequences. We're speaking about a very important financial link between Putin's mafia and the Western financial system. What do they do? when they steal money in billions and billions from Russians, they keep exporting it and investing it in the West, creating a safe harbor there, buying assets, uh, keeping their, their uh, profits, and, and so on. This financial link with the Russian dirty money, with the flow of corrupt money that was stolen from the Russian people should be finally broken. So sanctions against, against cronies and oligarchs should be seen not as just adding some individuals to, to the list, but as a clear message to Putin, you will not be allowed anymore to rob the Russians, to steal money from your own people and invest it in safe havens in the West. This is what sanctions against the oligarchs mean. And last point about uh, transatlantic cooperation, how to enhance transatlantic cooperation. My point is very simple. Putin wants to overlook Europe. He wants to say that Europe is just, just a subordinate of Washington, D.C. This is what Russian, Russian propaganda is always saying uh, about the European Union. You should really show that the European Union is a strong player here, that it can contribute in transatlantic dialogue on how to ensure the greater free democratic European space, including Russia. Be a strong player. Act. Uh, and that's important. I think we're on the way, but as I said in the beginning, there's been uh, re-election has been delayed a bit. I think everybody would welcome, uh, everybody in the free world would welcome if Europe catches up a bit. Many thanks for having me on this important discussion. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, on this note, allow me now to conclude our hearing. Thank you to all our guests, the three panelists, for their, from my point of view, very interesting and helpful and insightful comments and suggestions. We will certainly reflect on them, gentlemen, and use the most promising ones in the context of our work on the recommendation on the direction of the EU-Russia relations under the rapporteurship of Andreas Kubilius.